Okay, so we're recording, we're live. I'm here with Mr. Kyle Melko. And Kyle, what's your insurance company specifically named? Uh, so the brokerage I work for is Acumen Insurance Group. Acumen Insurance. So you're an insurance broker? Like what's the right. official title? Yeah, so I'm an insurance broker, a uh, licensed insurance broker, and uh, work for a brokerage that's been around for uh, close to 40 years. Okay, awesome. So you've worked your way into the Rockstar ecosystem. I know all my personal property insurance policies I've done through you and your part. Is it your partner, Andrew? Uh, he's just, uh, not just, but he helps me service my clients. He's more on the service side. Okay. Whereas you're like the upfront. Yeah. Kind of new policies and, uh, basically new policies. And he works on the renewals and service side changes, things like that. Okay. So a lot of Rockstar Inner Circle members specifically are going to be familiar with your name, right. Kyle, and also Andrew, because absolutely. So how, how did you work your way into the Rockstar ecosystem to the point where so many people know you, this is our first time meeting, which, yeah. you know, we've worked together since 2019. Right. Um, so how did you work your way in here? Uh, so back in 2010, actually, uh, Paul De Bruzzo had reached out uh, for a student rental policy. Um, I believe that might have been one of his first properties. And uh, especially back then, there wasn't as many companies doing that type of insurance. So um, and it's not the same as we'll discuss as a, a regular homeowners or rental policy. So he had reached out. We found a solution from there. And in the last 13 years, it's slowly snowballed into uh, working with a lot of uh, the same people that you guys are working with. Uh, is, is that the majority of business you do is with real estate investors? Right. I, I would consider myself a full-time real estate insurance broker. Okay. Um, and then we do the kind of the spinoffs, the home and auto, personal home and auto, uh, different stuff like that for investors. But uh, initially... And the majority of our my business uh, is is real estate. Uh, okay, sure. so yeah, I definitely want to ask you about the home and auto specifically for investors, right? Because like I'm with two of the same two of my policies are with the same company. Another one of my policies is a different company. And I think a lot of investors who have grown, you know, portfolios of several homes, their policies are all scattered amongst different companies because you're kind of going for the best rate and coverage at yep. the time. And you're shopping it around to different places, right. which can, I think, make it a bit more difficult to be able to lump everything in to these policies where, you know, home, auto, everything's under one and you can get discounts and stuff. Yeah. So it, it doesn't always make sense to combine everything. Sometimes the, the rates don't make sense or the coverage doesn't make sense. Um, or depending on what type of rental property it is, they don't do both those types of properties, the insurance companies. So, and, and the renewal dates can be kind of all over the place. So you kind of have to come up with a plan, at least start with determining when your renewal dates are, who are you with, and then have a discussion with your, with your broker or your agent as to, when you can renew, uh, review those things and the best time to make the switch, if it makes sense, if it doesn't. Um, but the key is just making sure you're comparing apples to apples. Um, in terms of coverage? Yeah, because what we see a lot of times, especially if you're dealing with the larger companies, they're looking to get your business. So they don't always have your best interest coverage-wise in mind. They have kind of their base policy, but they don't have, sometimes they don't seem to ask those questions and determine what the right coverages are and then find that balance of price and coverage. So sometimes people say, well, I saved $40 a month or I'm going to save $40 a month. But when you dive into the coverage, it's, it's not the same. There's so these situations, right? these are when people are going out and kind of shopping for insurance policies themselves and then presenting it to you right? and saying, Hey, I found this cheaper one. You know, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, exactly. They, they ha they're under the impression that every policy is the same when it's not. So sometimes there's a reduction in liability coverage or coverages that aren't there or some other coverages where the, the limit's lower and can cause big okay. problems in the event of a claim. Okay, so we can get into, yes, specific yeah, we'll coverages you recommend and stuff. I thought the best way to do this podcast, because I'm going to just tap into Kyle for all of his knowledge here, uh, would be to print out two of my own policies and walk through it because I have home insurance on all my properties. I don't know what the heck a lot of it is, like what I'm covered for, for specific coverages and inclusions and exclusions. Right. And I think a lot of people are probably in the same boat where it's like, hey, I closed on a property. I need insurance. You know, your rock star coach maybe directs you to work with a guy like Kyle. Kyle's like, here's the best policy for you. And you're like, okay, I'll just sign the papers. You know what I mean? And you might look into it a bit, like the main coverages, like right. liability or something. 
but I'm not sure about all these other things. So I'm going to walk you. So we're going to walk through two of my policies. The first one's a student rental policy specifically. There's going to be a whole bunch of questions along the way, diving into Kyle's knowledge. And then uh, we can talk more about general stuff. I think after we go through them, because I think we'll answer a lot of it. Yeah. So sounds good. So basically when we, there's a lot going on when a property is closing, right? You're dealing with the lawyers, you're dealing with buyers, sellers, your real estate agent. So we throw a lot of information at you, what's covered, what's not covered. But I think the challenge is, is that there's so much going on, there's bigger challenges you're facing. So a lot of times people don't look at that information that we're sending them. We do our best to try to bring it to the forefront, but definitely don't just set it away and forget it. Take the time when everything settles down to look at the information that we're providing you because a lot of times that stuff is there, you're just too busy with stuff going on. So this is good. I think we'll give people a chance to Dive yeah. Into that. And that's been the case for mine. It's like a year later on renewal, I'm looking at my policy much more in depth and I'm right. like, okay, what, am, what's my coverage here? What am I paying? Can I get cheaper rates? Yeah. You know, how much coverage do I need? Um, because it is just so rushed. Right. Right. Do you, do you find that's common? I think so. Because a lot of times when people come back and I didn't know this or I wasn't aware of this, and then you show them what you've sent them and highlighted and bolded <laughs> and underlined and it's right there. Yeah. But what I've come to realize is that they got bigger stuff going on when this is happening. Insurance is fairly low. It's on the, the totem pole. So when you get a chance, dive into that stuff because we usually send a lot of information and it's there. If you just take 10 minutes to read what's covered, what's not covered, mm -hmm. here's your options. This is why this is there. This is why it's not there. Things like that. So yeah, I think this is going to be fantastic for uh, for people. Okay, awesome. So why don't we start with the student rental policy? So specifically, uh, like, wh why do you need commercial insurance versus uh, just general home insurance? What's the difference between a rental property and a personal home? So what you'll see sometimes is the coverage is on a commercial form, and the intention and and the spirit of everything is the same as a quote unquote personal policy. These companies, they just work with a commercial wording and their commercial coverage, but it's covering a property essentially no different than if you're on a personal coverage form. That's just how these companies operate when it comes to their coverage. So um, it's just the wording? That's the only difference? The wording and just because a lot of these wordings are intended to cover, they deal more in just real estate. They deal in small business, big business. So uh, essentially breaks down into liability coverage, property coverage, and then all your extensions. It's no different than a personal policy. They've just, their wordings are considered a commercial form, but oh. it boils down to the same thing. So the two policies we're gonna talk about, they have the same intention. So is it a different risk profile though, having tenants living in the property versus you yourself living in the property? Right, so you wanna make sure you're covered, the, the property is being insured for its actual and intended use. Are, is it generally higher than personal home insurance? Not necessarily. It's just the companies that we work with, they offer it on a commercial form, but the coverage boils down to the same thing. They're insuring the property, they're insuring your liability. They've added in sewer backup, different things like that. They just operate on a commercial wording that's a blanket wording to cover more than just real estate because the companies work in more than just real estate. So a lot of the personal companies, they're just dealing in personal okay. real estate. So they've come up with their own personal form. But because a rental property is considered a business, it falls to these companies who insure businesses and, all, and rental properties, which yeah, is considered so, a business. So certain companies like this, kind of the regular markets, we'll call them, that deal in just your standard single family rentals, or they can add it to your personal insurance property, they don't deal um, in anything else when it comes to that, the wordings that they use. So they have a property wording that they use. A lot of companies that do the more the specialized stuff, conversion projects, student rentals, uh, boarding houses, things like that, they deal in more than just real estate. So they have a general wording that applies to everything, all different types of businesses, but they've added and tweaked it with their exclusions and endorsements for real estate. But a lot of people get hung up on, it's a commercial wording, but this is a personal rental. Don't get hung up on that. Look, dive into the wordings, what's covered, what's not covered, what the insurance company 
is on uh, is under the impression that you're using the property for. So what happens if you have a personal home insurance policy, like owner occupied, you yep. live in the property, right. but it's on a rental property. If something happens, does that affect the claim? Because it was, it was a tenant living in the property and you didn't inform the insurance company that the property was a rental and it was tenanted and then you can be denied the claim or coverage on that policy? Exactly. So you want to make sure that the insurance company is aware of what the property is actually being used for. Um, if you're living there as your primary residence, that's a totally different uh, situation than if you're renting it out. And like you said, they can deny a claim in the event that uh, an adjuster shows up and it's not your primary residence being rented out, especially if it's being rented out to students or multiple individuals that are unrelated situation like that. You want to avoid that uh, because they'll they'll deny they'll deny the claim for sure. Okay, so why are students different, and does it matter if the students are all on one lease or if they're on individual leases? So, insurance companies basically classify occupancy. There's a couple different ways, but one of them is um, is it a family? So is it you know mom, dad, and the kids? Um, typically, they're fine if there's like an aunt or an uncle if everyone's related, but uh, as soon as there's unrelated individuals sharing common spaces, kitchen, bathrooms, dining areas, um, they don't have their own self-contained unit. That's something that's an exclusion on um, policies for single family rentals. Um, we have to find insurance with a company that is allowing for unrelated individuals, um, which students fall into that category. Like um, unrelated, like literally not relatives. Exactly. Like and usually more than two or three. So um, sometimes they're fine with, uh, say, me or you rented a place. We're just roommates. You looking? What's that? You looking? Always. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I could save on rent, man. Yeah, there you it. go. Um, but yeah, typically once you get beyond, say, two, maybe three, sometimes they'll make an exception. Um, they consider it more of like a boarding house or a student rental. Even if they're all on one lease, um, they they want to classify that and insure it as a, um, a boarding house or a student rental, which we have solutions for that. And it's not uh, typically much different. Is it a bit um, higher? It's a bit higher. There, I mean, for, for obvious reasons, right? There's a little more usage on the home. Um, on the infrastructure of the home, plumbing, and typically, um, and not to paint everyone with the same brush, but students or uh, young people, if they're all living together, they're not paying as close attention to toilets that are leaking, different stuff like that, where little problems become bigger problems faster. Um, or if it's your primary residence, you know, you kind of have your, uh, you know, a little better uh, feel for when little things start to not be normal on a house. Yeah. Um, so they literally, yeah, they just understand the demographic and see it as a higher risk profile. Yeah. And historically, uh, you know, there's data to back that up uh, claims wise as to the types of claims uh, and more foot traffic to that. I was going to ask, is there data backing this or they're just right. going off the, like the idea of it, which is legitimate. Like, yeah. So, so there's, it, there's actual data backing it, this. It's a combination of both. So, um, and especially because they insure everything and they classify everything in a certain category, um, they can see the claims that occur on student rentals, boarding houses, things like that. So, um, okay. So insurance for in the eyes of insurance, how do you classify the difference between a boarding house and a student rental? Um, so typically there'll be a question in regards to are all the occupants full-time students or do you have a blend of young professionals and students? Um, so typically there'll be a question about that uh, during the initial conversation with the, with the client or the broker. And from there, I pass that information on to the insurance companies. Some will do a blend and just want to know the total number of occupants. Some will only do strictly students. Some uh, we'll only do strictly boarding houses or they do both. They just have a different category um, and a rating rate for those uh, types of risk. Okay. Does having a common room in the home, like a living room, dining room space, you know, common, obviously everyone's using the kitchen regardless. Does that, but that, does that common area, the living room make a difference between it being classified as a rooming house or student rental in any way? Uh, no. So the last question is about the, who the occupants are. Are they full-time students? Or are they? Just so it's just whatever you put, that's what's going to, um, but the, the key difference, like you said, is 
are there common elements being shared? So it, some companies will only insure it if it's a completely self-contained unit, their own kitchen, their own bathroom, their own living space. No other occupants can get into that space. Uh, and it basically has to do with those tenants having control over who's coming in, who's coming out. Um, you know, there's more of a risk when there's shared common elements. Um, so they just classify it that way. It's got to be a completely self-contained unit. And then they kind of consider it a single family unit. If it's a single family in those units, um, even if they're self-contained units and you have a group of five people and a group of five people in another unit, then it's going to be classified as a student rental or a boarding house. If unrelated individuals are sharing common space, even within different units. Okay. How does it rank in terms of expense to the, like how expensive the policy is? Is it personal home insurance? then like single family home insurance, then like multi-unit insurance, like a duplex or triplex, then like student rental and rooming house. Is it roughly that? So what we see on our end is everything is very uh, individualized rating more than ever. So they have data on postal codes on, uh, there's a central claims database for each property if a claim has been filed with an insurance company. It's very tough these days. You know, a lot of people call and they're just looking for a ballpark number on a house. It's very challenging to do that. Or, you know, I've gotten away from giving people a ballpark number. Usually I only need, you know, a couple minutes of your time to get some very basic data and then I can give you a ballpark number. But I've seen single family homes that either the, the area is terrible for claims or the infrastructure is very old in, in that area. Or there's so much data that goes into each property and, and underwriting that it is best to take, you know, two to 10 minutes to have that conversation and really dive into the property. And typically we can turn around numbers pretty quick. So, okay. But uh, generally student rentals and boarding houses are the most expensive. Generally speaking, Gen those are going to be more, if you were to take the same property and have it as a single family rental, be cheaper. It'd be cheaper than if it was a student rental. Perfect. That's the easiest kind of way to look at it. If, if you were to take one property, Okay. Different occupancies. Yeah. It's going to go up that scale. Now you sure. don't want to ballpark. I totally get that. It's very individual. Is there a yeah. rough range you can give that you're seeing right now for these all types of rentals between a hundred and 200 on average? Yeah. The, kind of the hundred dollars a month. Those days have kind of They're gone. gone. Unfortunately, I think, um, the minimum premium we're seeing on properties, call it a, you know, a one story thousand square foot, property in a good area probably 15 to 1700 dollars a year okay and then uh, if you get into some areas um windsor has really it, it it recovered for a bit now we're still seeing that area like the rates the infrastructure still needs a lot of work in that area the claims are there the water damage fires even and i'm not painting that whole area in general but it seems to be an area where we really have a challenge finding really low rates we can still get really solid coverage but the claims are still happening in that area um, in any area where there's waterways insurance companies are still kind of being hesitant if they're you know if you have mm -hmm. a, a river in your backyard or your waterfront or things like that yeah one of my places is, is pretty close to the welland canal in st yeah. Catharines, and that one is is jacked up because of the how close it is. There's a sump pump in the basement, a lot of groundwater in the area. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, areas like that, especially Niagara region, a lot of the, the areas where there's great homes, great investment opportunities, the infrastructure in those areas is aging. Um, there, you know, the houses were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s. The service lines to the house haven't been updated uh, by the, by the city or by the property owner. And unfortunately everyone kind of gets grouped into certain demographics, right? So when it comes to the property, so, um, you know, these service lines are failing or, or bursting or things like that. And w we all pay for it, uh, when it comes to the bottom line, right? Okay. So what if you live in the home, but you rent out a portion of it? Yep. Totally fine. Um, but same thing, make sure you're passing that on to, uh, your broker or agent and uh, you want to make sure would yeah. you need specific rental coverage for that yeah so typically there might be a small surcharge for liability with the additional um, tenant having being in the property um, same thing they're going to want to know if they're living in a self-contained unit are there sh are you sharing common elements um, you want to make sure you have coverage for things like your rental income that you're collecting because 
in the event of an insured loss, you'll be reimbursed if uh, the tenant is displaced for the rent that you'd normally be collecting. Um, a common misconception is that um, the tenant, uh, if the tenant has to go live in an Airbnb short term and their costs over and above their rent that they normally pay, a lot of times they come back at the landlord and say, hey, it's costing me an additional $2,000 a month to live at this other place. If they obtain the right tenant's insurance, then those additional costs will be picked up by their tenant's insurance policy. Interesting. Um, so that would be... They call it additional living expenses. So okay, so that's like an add-on for tenant insurance? For a tenant's insurance, any decent tenant's insurance policy will have additional living expenses. So that's going to cover the cost, typically, of their their costs over and above what their normal cost of living is if they're displaced because of an insured loss. Okay, so tenant insurance is made up of liability coverage yep. and then also contents. Right. Those are the main two coverages, yep. right? Yeah. So which ones... Um, which one requires the additional living expenses? Is it, is it so that that's typically an, uh, part of the an additional coverage that's built in. A lot of those policies are package policies. So they have a lot of, you know, when you see these policies, there's 20 things listed. People don't pay attention to that. But in my opinion, it's probably the most important coverage on those policies because it causes the most frustration or causes the most financial loss to tenants when they get displaced and yeah you're reimbursing them their rent that they're paying to them but now living in a hotel or living in a short-term rental and even you know, their increased costs of food and things like that because they don't have maybe they might not have a kitchen to cook things like yeah. that those things can be picked up and then there's no tension now between the landlord and the tenant because they're looking at the landlord as this is your fault and the the insurance company is saying, well, we don't cover those costs of your tenant, but if they have, uh, and the responsibility ultimately falls onto the tenant. Exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, situation situationally, if they might not have the means to cover those costs and now it just becomes a way bigger problem than if they were paying 20 yeah, or $30 a month for tenants insurance, right? Okay. So now on the Ontario standard lease, um, there is a little checkbox, right? Where you can require tenants to have liability insurance only yes. though. So it, it mentions content insurance is optional, right? That's right. So, um, you can use that as your ability to make sure your tenants have insurance. The good thing is, is I'll, you can't really just buy liability insurance as a tenant. It's kind of all packaged together. Um, you can put your contents limit really low, 5,000, 10,000. But as long as those other coverages are built into those policies, you'll be fine as a tenant. But if you do your um, you know, due diligence as a landlord and enforce those conditions of the standard Ontario lease agreement, that will in the long run help you in the event of a claim because your tenants will have insurance. Whether they know it or not, they're probably getting that additional living expense coverage, and that takes uh, some heat off you in the event of a claim. Okay. Uh, one less thing to deal with, right, as a landlord. Totally. Yeah, I agree. But it, so, but it could be a good idea to mention to get to that to get that additional living coverage. Then. Right. I mean, you can. Uh, I mean, and by all means, reach out to me, and I can kind of help you. So that's my second question. Um, do you help with tenant insurance? We do, yeah. So um, whether it's myself or I have a few people that kind of work along with me that handle a lot more tenants, uh, kind of the smaller policies, not that they're less important, but they do a lot of that stuff a lot quicker than I can. So it's either myself or uh, a member of our team there that uh, – can get tenants insurance and it's oh, relatively cool. inexpensive. Okay, yeah, because I'm filling properties all the time and constantly dealing with new lease agreements. Right. Tenants are asking me, hey, do you know where I can get yep. you know the best coverage or where I should go for this? And I've been telling them go to lowestrates.ca. What's your thought on that? Is it? Uh, they're, uh, they have their place for sure. Um, what I recommend, and obviously I'm a little biased, but speak to a professional directly Yeah. and find someone. I mean, there's nothing wrong with uh, these direct online, get it yourself, uh, the bigger companies. But the difference I find is that every time you call, you're speaking to someone different. They don't kind to, they don't get to learn your story, kind of what you need. And every time you call, you're on hold, you know, potentially for a yeah. long time. Speaking to some robots before that. Yeah. Where, you know, typically you can reach out to us 
um, you're speaking to the same one or two people all the time. Um, and we have the misconception of being more expensive, but it's really because we're looking at out for your best interest. And yeah, you might be able to find like brokers in general or exactly you guys yeah. specifically. Yeah. Brokers in general or, or agents. If you're speaking to someone directly, a lot of times a few questions will get you in a better place coverage wise than just when you go online for 30 seconds and you punch in some information. And if you're, you're just rate shopping, if you've only been asked five questions, there's probably a good chance that you are missing some coverages or this policy isn't the best for you, even if the price seems very attractive. Okay, awesome. So you can reach out to your team. Yep. Um, now let's go through this policy a bit. So yep. it says form of business partnership or limited partnership. Um, is that just because I own the house with a, with a partner? Exactly. So um, it's beyond one person. So, so the, the company just wants to know that? Yeah. And it yep. would be like a sole proprietorship or if it was just a, just me owning the property? Yeah. So a lot of times just pay attention to who's listed as a named insured or additional named insured. Um, a lot of times that's the first thing listed on a policy, but just make sure that everyone on title, because they have what we call an insurable interest in the property is listed as either a named insured or additional named insured. Okay. Um, let's go through this. Okay. So my coverage is broken down by property and I'll, I can say the numbers. It's uh, yeah, 1657 sure. for the property liability on this one is 700 a month. It says other zero 700 a year. Yeah. Or sorry, 700 yeah. a year. Yeah. Geez. <laughs> uh, so total premium for the year is 2357. Right. Um, is that a typical breakdown? Uh, properties like double the amount of liability. So property is made up of a bunch of coverages. So typically you're going to see a lot more premium there Okay. where liability is kind of one coverage that they've, uh, they have one charge for it yeah, based on it. the property. What about what's other? It says other zero. That's just other add-ons and stuff. So yeah, a lot of times there can be some coverages that are included. There's no charge for them. Um, sometimes there is a charge for them. So that could be your endorsements, uh, sewer backup, different things like that. If it's not grouped in with the property, there could be a charge for it uh, that you might see listed somewhere on the policy. Okay. So now my bank's name is also on this policy, the bank I have the mortgage with. Right. So the bank's name needs to be on here because the this insurance policy is also covering the bank. Should there be a claim? Right. So they have an insurable interest in the property. Uh, a lot of times when it comes to larger claims or total losses on the property and for one reason or another, the property is not going to be rebuilt or... Uh, a lot of times in large losses, sometimes the bank has to be paid if they're involved in the repair process or if the property is being, something's being done with the property. They have an insurable interest in the property because you've taken out a mortgage. You're not the sole owner of the property if you have a mortgage on the property. So in the event of large losses, things like that, they need to be notified because in the event the, of a large payout, typically the smaller claims are just handled between the insured and the insurance company large payout. Sometimes the bank has to be paid out um, and they want to be notified and they want to be notified if the policy is canceled. So in the event that a policy is canceled, the bank will be notified that there's no longer insurance on the property. Um, so we need to know who and they did, are. And does that break the stipulation of the mortgage? And they're going to reach out and be like, Hey, you need insurance on this. Right. So um, a lot of times, and sometimes it happens just by air. If a policy renews or you switch companies um, or you cancel a policy, a lot of times the lender is notified automatically. Um, so not something to panic about. Just let your broker know that sometimes we have to send a new confirmation of insurance. To is the it lender. a good idea to reach out to the bank's mortgage department just to let them know every time you've switched a, a new policy or? or? Uh, I would say the best plan of action would be to uh, advise your broker or agent to prepare a confirmation of insurance, send that off to your lender. Sometimes your mortgage agent can even take care of that for you. Um, and a lot of times they have specific departments, uh, like Scotia bank and they have an, an email you can send the confirmation to directly, um, showing that there's property in, uh, insurance on the property. Uh, and that's if you switch to a new policy or if you renew as well, typically a renewal won't doesn't send change any cancellation. Anything. If you cancel a policy or sometimes if the insurance company makes some changes on there and some cancellations go out either intentionally or by accident. Um, but a reasonable broker or agent can take care of that for you and provide confirmation to the lender. 
Okay. So now we'll go through the specific coverages. Sure. Um, so it's got the deductible and then what's this now? What's this to say here? It's co-insure percent? Co-insurance. So um, there's one thing that a lot of people, even some insurance professionals, if you're not working with policies that have that coverage, they have they don't understand what it is and how it works. So what co-insurance is, is it's a clause on the policy and what it does is it's the insurance company's way of making you've insured the property to its full value. You can't say, um, so we'll use simple math here. So um, we have a program in our end, we put in all the specs of the house and that determines the rebuild value of the home. So say we come up with 500,000 and I go to you and say, Anthony, you know, we recommend to insure the property for 500,000. Does that sound good to you? Um, and you say, no, 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 I only want to insure it for 200,000. To, for the rebuild value? Yeah. So you're a reasonable person. So obviously that doesn't make sense to you, but pump, some people are saying, well, no, I want, I want to uh, pay as least uh, as much money as for this pro pro uh, policy as possible. Right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we don't really allow people to go against this clause, but uh, basically what it, so the co-insurance co on this policy is 90%. So the, I believe. Yeah. 90. So, so how come it's not a hundred? So, but all that means so that 90% means that you need to make sure that this property is insured to at least 90% of its actual rebuild value of its true rebuild value. If you're under that number, so just put people's minds at ease here. We, I feel like we do a good job at evaluating properties on an annual basis or semi-annual basis to keep up with inflation and things like that. So majority of the time, 99.999% of the time, you're not gonna be in violation of this clause. Unless you go against the advice and direction of the broker, we don't let people do this that. Is based on all the stats you're plugging in. Yeah, so we put in you know, the construction materials of the house, square footage, roof, different stuff Detached like that. Detached garage, this. Yeah, thing. exactly. We put in all those specs of a program that gives us a value of the home. Um, we have that discussion with people, present that that value to people. I mean, we, myself personally and our team, we don't cut corners to try and bring the building value down. Mm -hmm. um, but long story short, if you insure the house lower than 90%, so they do give you a little bit of wiggle room to account for inflation, things like that. In the event of uh, a large loss or a total loss on the house, if you're not insured for at least 90% of its true value, you get penalized further than what you've insured the home for. Okay. So what they do is they take what you did insure the home for, divide that by what you should have insured the home for, and they multiply that by the amount of the loss and you get a percentage of what the actual loss on the home was. Okay, cool. So building, I feel covered now. Thank you for that, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, contents, what does contents cover specifically? Essentially, it's your um, furniture appliances you have in the home. Um, if you have any sort of other contents on the property. So because this is like an unfurnished rental, yeah. this, this was just my appliances, my fridge, Basically, my yeah. stove, my uh, dishwasher, yep. washer dryer. And with, um, we'll call it since COVID started, uh, we've all seen the price of that stuff or the supply chains be affected for that kind of stuff. So what I recommend, take a quick inventory of that stuff. What, it, what would it cost you to go out and replace that stuff tomorrow? And uh, even if you kind of overestimate, because a lot of times, yeah, you can find a cheaper fridge, but it's gonna be 10, 12, six months before you get that. Have a good solid number where you can go out and replace all that stuff tomorrow. These days we're using uh, a general number of um, 7,500, five grand if you have some, some basic lower end stuff in the house, uh, but 7,500 per unit. Generally, if it, that's just, you know, fridge, stove, washer, dryer, that should put you in a pretty good space to get that stuff replaced. Okay. Now we've got, um, replacement cost endorsement. What's that? Yep. So that is one coverage. Definitely pay attention to that, especially when you get into more of the specialized stuff, student rentals, boarding houses, older homes, unique properties, you know, the list of that kind of stuff goes on. What you want to make sure is that you have replacement costs if it's available or guaranteed replacement cost, ideally if it's more of a single family rental or with a personal company. And what that does is make sure that um, depreciation isn't applied to the 
building value in the event of a claim. So if it's on an actual cash value settlement basis, which you may see, and a lot of times when people say, oh, I've found a cheaper policy, this is one of the differences that we see. So when it's actual cash value, depreciation may be applied in the event of a claim. So if the house is 100 years old, the adjuster might start to apply depreciation no different than they would to a car to the bricks, the lumber, the building material. And a lot of times if it's um, uh, materials that are no longer used, a lot of depreciation up to 50% of the building value could be applied to uh, the settlement cost. And you could be responsible for, so you could be 50% now out, uh, out of your own pocket for the uh, replacement cost of the building. But when you have replacement costs, it's just to, those materials, replacing, replacing those materials is just determined at today's value. So as long as that's in line with your building value, you, there's no depreciation applied in the event of a claim. Okay. Sewer backup endorsement. That's obviously just sewer backup. Um, yep. Is that a common one that happens? So when looking at a policy, water damage can be broken down into basically a couple different categories, um, insurable categories. Water da- Your standard water damage, any sort of broad form policy um, or comprehensive policy, if you see that, you're going to have water damage coverage built into your policy. If it's on a name perils basis, which is a lot of times another big difference that people don't catch or it's not been explained to them, we try to mention this or we do mention this in every quote that we send out. Name perils is only going to cover the stu- the named perils or cause of loss that we that are stated in the policy. And if it's on name perils, unless you see water damage added back in, there's no water damage coverage, burst pipe, frozen pipes. So flood, that's the uh, next one here. A I flood, flood, yeah. So floods is kind of the third category, and I'll talk about that in a second because people think flood and they think any sort of flood in the house. Um, but just back to the water damage coverage for a second. If you have uh, broad form, which this policy is, or comprehensive form, water damage, burst pipe, frozen pipe, the, the resulting damage from those types of losses is covered. Um, sewer backup is excluded under any policy, but then it's added back on. That's why you see a separate line for it. And typically there may be a lower limit or a higher deductible or both for that type of coverage, but any sort of backup through a shower, sewer, drain, sink, dishwasher, anything like that is going to be your sewer backup loss. Um, and then the third category is flood. But when you see flood, especially on these commercial policies, Flood is actually the overflow of a man-made or natural body of water. Um, So fairly unlikely in most situations, even in cities like yourself where there's canals and things like that, the odds of the canal flooding out the town, probably pretty unlikely, but there is some coverage there. Typically there's not a charge for it. They've built it into their wording in the event that something absolutely drastic happens. Um, But when people say, oh, my house flooded out, that coverage typically isn't under that coverage unless it's some sort of outer source massive tsunami like, kind of situation yeah, someone right? leaving the bathtub tap on but yeah overflowing it that's not gonna so when that when you see oh my house flooded out well why did it flood out that's what we need to determine typically a lot of times it's a sewer backup toilets backed up drains backed up and the claim actually falls under the sewer backup coverage on the policy now on one of my properties i had a hot water tank burst It was an old thing and it kind of flooded the one room and luckily it wasn't worse. Um, But when I had a plumber come in and look at it, um, maybe it was for something else, but he was like, hey, you you don't have a floor drain in the basement. Right. And then we discovered that before we bought it, someone had laminated over it in another area. And he's like, in the event of this happening again, or if it was worse, you needed to make an insurance claim, you wouldn't be covered because the floor drain was covered. I wouldn't say that's necessarily true. Um, you want to make sure you have the proper coverage potentially for water escaping from water heaters or any typically a water heater. A lot of times there's that's not, a specific coverage. Uh, well, typically it's covered under water escape on your policy, right? But, um, which would most times be picked up under the, so that's water related standard. claims. Special yeah. So deductible that would fall under water related claims. So Got it. it's picked up under the standard coverage, but they do apply, apply a higher deductible to any sort of water related claim on the policy. But, um, a couple things to keep in mind there. A lot of companies are starting to crack down on the age of your water heater. We 
We see a lot of failure after about the 10 year mark. Now, a lot of times, especially if it's a rental, generally you have to file the insurance claim and um, the rental companies won't name any names. They will reimburse the, the insurance company for the claim, but they want you to go through insurance to have everything repaired that way. So it ends up being a very minimal to zero dollar claim on your record, which can help. Um, but a lot of times, especially if it's rental, the, um, or sorry, a lot of times what we're seeing now is once the water heater reaches 10 years of age, uh, we've seen companies start to put exclusions where there's no coverage if there's escape from a water heater. This policy doesn't have that exclusion, this policy specifically. Certain companies look for, you'll see water heater exclusion on your policy. So if you see that, definitely look into it. If you've had a new water heater installed, let us know or let the insurance company know because sometimes we'll take that, that exclusion off based on the age of the water heater. But we've seen companies start to add stuff like that in. Um, and if you're not reviewing policies when they come in as an insurance broker or agent, sometimes you don't even see that's been added in. Now it's a problem in the event of a claim. So is having a hot water rental versus owning it actually kind of a good thing in, in, in the event of a claim? It can help reduce the cost that's being associated with you against a claim. It doesn't make a huge difference coverage wise or premium wise. Mm -hmm. um, no, sorry. Okay. Yep. That's good to know. But then you also mentioned that, um, it's not going to affect you, your premiums going forward. Does property insurance claims work the same way as car insurance claims, where if you're, if you're making a claim, you can expect your insurance premiums to go up. Some companies will offer, uh, claims protection. If you see that on your policy, you kind of get like one Paul, one claim that won't be rated against you. If you have multiple claims in a three to five year window, they can start to be rated against you. Really? Not all policies offer that. The This company doesn't offer that. There's no black and white answer to what can be rated against you in the event of a claim uh, from an insurance company standpoint. They will take that into consideration, especially if it's something that you haven't taken the proper steps to prevent it from happening again, or if it's um, uh, things out of your control, the infrastructure in the area is really starting to fail, things like that. They could, the insurance company can look for ways to either increase your rates, in, raise deductibles. We are seeing a lot of companies have higher deductibles, especially for anything water related, as you can see, because that's where the claims are, um, unfortunately. But, um, so if you're, you know, you've got five claims within a three year period, you know, they're going to start looking at you like, okay, this could be a sign of negligence. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they want to see you doing your part to, to do what you can. Obviously some, some things are out of your control. Um, but that falls into the category of why it's tough to ballpark a number because they want to know, do you have a sump pump? Has it been waterproofed? Is there a sewer backflow valve? Um, some cities provide data as to when the infrastructure has been updated in the area. All these factors go into determining rates on houses, but what you want to avoid, one claim is typically not a big deal. You may see a raise to your rates, you may not, but if you get into a multiple claim situation, especially, especially on a specific property, that could cause you headaches and a lot of challenges in getting reasonable rates um, because they're starting to see a trend of this property not, from an insurance standpoint, not being, you know, bottom line profitable for them um, and maybe a sign of bigger problems in the area or that specific property. Okay. Earthquake shock endorsement. I'm covered for earthquakes. That's good to know. So same thing. There's a huge deductible um, and they're not really charging for it most times. Because it's so infrequent. Exactly. It's there if something drastic happens. Um, but yeah. you know, most, most areas, especially in Ontario, there's virtually no chance that you'll see an earthquake claim against your house. Uh, okay. Building bylaws endorsement. Yep. So bylaws, that's, uh, can be a very important coverage. Uh, long story short, if there's a claim against your property, now something needs to be updated on the house because it was, uh, in today's building code or bylaws against, uh, the rules, they'll pay the additional cost to have it brought up to uh, be in uh, up to code or can you give me a common example one example uh, we don't see that a lot but one uh, example that uh, I remember being told over the years 
Uh, you might have uh, a garage or the house might be built too close to the corner. They don't allow houses to be built that close to the corner anymore. So the the uh, rebuild might have to be moved back a few feet or the you know, house, house might be need to be scaled back. Or another common example. The whole be, house just moved? Well, if it's, uh, say it could be the porch on the front of the house extends too far or the garage is built. A lot, well, we see it a lot in uh, the older areas. The garage is built right against the sidewalk. So say there's a total loss on a garage or something, they'll rebuild you a garage, but it needs to be, I, and I'm not an expert on that stuff, five feet back from the, from the curb or something like that, right? That's a drastic example. Something simple might be, you might see it a lot on the, the, the really older homes, uh, the height of uh, railings in the house. You know, when you go into a lot of these old century homes and stuff like that, the railings like, you know, three feet off the, uh, the ground. So now they need to rebuild this, railings in the home they need to be uh you know bylaws or building code requires them to be a certain height there might be an increased cost with that okay uh, there's lots of examples if you sure that's if you good. google it yeah i think i think uh, uh yeah people will get the point yeah um fire department service charges extension so that uh that one uh something to pay attention to if the house is in a rural area or a, a neighbor's a town where they don't have maybe a full-time fire department if a neighboring township or city is called in to help assist in a fire, uh, that's not covered because you pay your taxes towards the fire department in your township or neighborhood. Um, if the neighboring city has to come help, they're gonna send a bill and they're gonna be looking for someone to cover those costs. That's what that coverage goes towards. Okay, so maybe more important for like a small rural town. Exactly, yeah, okay. where there's not a full-time fire department. Um, yeah, something like that uh, okay. would be covered. Now, there's a cooking in rooms exclusion on this. So we see that in your policy. That has to do with they want to see cooking done in designated areas, a.k.a. the kitchen. Um, they don't want to see hot plates. And a lot of times on student rentals, boarding houses, people get a little creative with how they're cooking their meals or they want their privacy in their area. Um, any claim arising out of that could be excluded. Um so you just want to make sure that you make it clear to tenants there's no no hot plates, no uh, camping stoves, different things like that. <laughs> Fires could be caught, you know, for yeah. obvious reasons, just I think. picturing somebody in their, their desk in these small student rooms yep. with like a Coleman camping propane stove. It's not uh, out of the question. That then a lot of these a lot of times exclusions <laughs> around policies because stuff has happened, right? The insurance companies aren't making this stuff up. They've they've had massive claims or small claims or a trend in stuff of claims that shouldn't be happening or that they don't want to insure because it's, you know, it's not reasonable. Yeah. Um, so something like that is in there to make sure. So that explains the next one, vandalism by tenants. Yeah. So, so another student rental specific one. Exactly. And that's something, um, that's kind of a whole can of worms itself, but long story short, um, it's most likely excluded on your policy unless you've added the coverage. Um, and just be aware of what that covers inquire about what is included and what's not included because a lot of times the students um, or when it's uh, a house with a lot of occupants just the general wear and tear on a property can be a lot and sometimes what happens is the tenants move out and the flooring's thrashed from just their overall usage or there's a hole in the drywall here and there and and people reach out about saying, well, it's vandalism. Yeah, because they it's, punched holes in it. Yeah, so, and, um, you know, not to open a can of worms here, but an adjuster might come in and say, well, yeah, like, that punch is one claim. That's going to be another claim. Like, it's not, they don't just blanket necessarily everything all together. Um, but if it's a situation where the tenants are leaving or you've, um, you know, had them evicted and they go and they smash the electrical box or smash windows and you know it can be determined that it's one claim you filed a police report you've done your due diligence there um you know there can be coverage for that uh, okay so because this one's a student rental one is, is that why this exclusion's thrown in because they're like oh it's more likely with student rentals is going to be vandalism right yeah there's a chance that you know maybe they have a party or you know yeah my first students i inherited them 
And uh, so I didn't pick them and right. they were good kids, but they really didn't like the guy who was managing the property before we bought it. And uh, so they had wrote like F this guy, like the guy's name. <laughs> on, there you uh, go. The inside of like some cupboards and stuff like that. Yeah. And then on move out day, they probably got drunk and punched some holes in the walls. And so people are worried about that with student rental. So I don't want to scare anyone off, but like it's pretty easy to repair a hole in the drywall. Like it wasn't actually a huge deal. And since we've found our own tenants from that point forward, nobody's been punching holes, but I just laughed when I walked in the, the house and I saw the holes. Yeah. So like you said, perfect example, a lot of times stuff can be repaired at a lower cost than what you perceive it to be. Yeah. Keep in mind deductibles, keep in mind that you'd have a claim on your record. Is it worth it to put in a very small claim? when you could probably, um, and have that claim potentially rated against you. Um, or is it worth it just to kind of pay out of your pocket? Totally. Um, no, it's, it's great to know that, it, that the claims can work against you in the long run. I just, I don't know why I didn't know that. Yeah. So, I mean, so if we look at the big picture here, um, you had a tenant and he goes in one instance and punches 10 holes in the drywall <laughs> and that can be fixed for, I'm, I'm not a drywall guy, but say 500 bucks. Yeah. Someone could come in and do it. You decide to file a claim and it's $500 over your deductible. So say the deductible, I think the deductible is 2,500 on that. So say all said and done, tenant goes crazy, causes $3,000 in damage. You're responsible for the first 2,500. Mm -hmm. They pay the 500 out of pocket. So now you have that claim. Now, two months down the line, a water line blows. Now you have $150,000 in water damage. Well, instead of having that one water damage claim, now you have multiple claims and some companies, their underwriting guidelines are more than one claim. We don't renew you or there's a surcharge or things like that. Well, now it's like, why did I file that? Yeah. There was some claim that was silly, right? Got it. So just keep in mind the big picture and that's conversation. We can have the same conversation with a, a client and kind of always contact your broker first in the event of a claim, because sometimes we can kind of talk scenarios and that will help you in your ultimate, ultimately it's your decision if you want to file a claim or not, but sometimes we can kind of walk through some different scenarios that'll help you make your decision. So for claim related things or questions you have around your policy or coverages, is it better to speak with you as opposed to reaching out to the insurance company that you're set up with because maybe you don't have the same bias or you can give like a more honest opinion? or so recommendation to someone? Most companies won't talk to you directly anyways. They'll oh, okay. ask you to reach out to your broker or agent. Got it. Um, sometimes when you're dealing directly with the insurance company, um, just keep in mind what, you know, as brokers, our mandate is to work on behalf of clients when we're speaking to insurance companies um, and act on behalf of companies when we're speaking to clients. So we're kind of that middle person, right? So if you're calling us and inquiring about stuff, I mean, myself especially, we have your best interest in mind, right? I try to put myself in people's shoes as much as possible. So I try to walk through the same thing, different scenarios or advise what, what's in your best interest in this situation, or at least give you the information and the data to, to make that decision. Um, but if you reach out to insurance companies, uh, you can, in a claim situation, a lot of times you can follow the claim directly with the insurance company. But if it comes down to that drywall situation, they'll open a claim for you, no problem. Um, they might deny the claim, but now there's kind of that record on the insurance company's end. Um, you know, we're obligated to report or make sure properties have been repaired. So, um, but a lot of times it's best to speak to us because we can kind of be that middleman and give you some a lot more information than if you call the insurance company directly. Okay, uh, rent or rental value covered for 80%, co-insure 80%. Oh, so the same thing, so the co-insurance applies to that? Yeah, you're, got it. You're yeah. gonna get your full rental income subject yes. to the deductible, but you need to make sure that you're reporting at least 80% of the actual rental income to the insurance company, or you could be penalized for how much rental income you'll be reimbursed. Got it. So if I'm raising rent every year, let us know. Or students move out, I bump it up significantly. It's even more important. Yep. And any, um, I mean, we do it, and uh, I would think everyone else is doing it. We're going to request for that updated number when we send your renewal. You know, let us know if there's a change in occupancy, so change in rent, things like that. I right? feel like people are almost afraid. Yeah. To let you know what the updates have been. Sure. Or the new rent or whatever, because they just yep. assume their policy is going to go up in price. What are your thoughts on that? 
rental income coverage especially one we're not reporting these numbers to the cra a lot of people are you know paranoid that we're gonna if they're doing something else that's their own business but a lot of times that coverage is a few dollars a month so letting us know the rent has went up one percent two percent whatever three percent or a small amount the cost on the from an insurance standpoint is is nominal right so yeah and you are paying to cover yourself. But you might be in a situation if you haven't let us know in the, ne- the last few years, now you're in violation of that coinsurance clause. And now you're going to be penalized. You're going to get a fraction of what you actually should be reimbursed. Where if you just let us know and paid the extra $3 a year, I'm, I'm using a generic number here, but then they're going to reimburse you the full amount. So coinsurance doesn't mean that you're getting a percentage of the amount as long as you're reporting true values to 80% us. of what it actually yeah, is. At least 80%. So they give you some wiggle room in case you forgot to report. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Haven't had the time to report it. And yeah. then how come there's no deductible for that one? Um, because there's a limit on it. So a lot of times when you see a limit on stuff, sewer backup, sewer backup has a deductible, but a lot of times, and it's going to be built into the whole claim. So in the event of any claim, you only pay one deductible typically. So, they're going to ask you to pay the deductible on the property side. They build in the rental income coverage as part of the claim. Sometimes, and usually it's the higher of any deductible. So if you have a water-related claim, you pay the higher deductible, the 5000 but you don't get hit with a $1,000 building deductible or any other deductibles. You typically just have to pay the, or you'll be responsible to pay the higher deductible, uh, even if there's multiple coverages involved in a single claim. Okay. Terrorism exclusion. So if somebody blows my house up. So uh, that would suck. We've eh? seen that come in after 9 11. Um, typically before 9 11, there was no terrorism exclusions on any policies. And it bankrupted um, a lot of insurance companies um, as a result of, and different terrorism, but 9 11 was kind of the turning point when we started to see this exclusion on policies. So, um, in the event that there's damage to the property and it's deemed result of terrorism, you may not be covered. A lot of times, I mean, we don't see it a lot on residential properties, not something to be concerned with, but you don't see it a lot or you've same, never seen it. I've never seen a <laughs> terrorism exclusion <laughs> applied. Say, fortunately, I mean, hopefully we never see anything like that again. Totally. Um, but it's something, and same thing, got to keep in mind these wordings apply to businesses, um, property, different stuff like that. So anything, if it's deemed to be terrorism related, there is a chance that uh, a claim not may not be applied. The insurance company has the exclusion in there to potentially deny a claim. Uh, but that was brought on by the billions of dollars that were paid out as a result of 9-11. Mm-hmm. And a so lot of times stuff applies companies. globally. Yeah. yeah, they're scrambling to cover their butts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so liability, $2 million coverage. Is that enough these days? Is that a good amount? So definitely a discussion to have with your broker. If you have multiple properties, um, especially multiple student rentals. I'll give one example here that I find kind of um, people understand and take into consideration when they say, well, I, I, you know, I just want a million or I want... If you have um, a student rental, uh, especially at schools that specialize in people that end up with very lucrative careers, doctors, lawyers, different stuff like that, business people, anything really. And uh, say a doctor is just, you have a a group of doctors that are staying in your house and uh, your porch, uh, you haven't paid attention to the railings, the railings are faulty. He slips and falls down the stairs of your front porch and breaks his wrist and now he's told you can never be a surgeon because you don't have the ability to can you imagine what he's going to sue you for uh most likely going to be more than a million dollars um based on his potential earning uh income um so something to keep in mind there when when you're thinking well is two million too much or i don't i think a million's enough yeah, forget um, that. Don't rent a surgeon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but that that example seems to make sense to people as to well, why do I need two million? Why can't I just have a million? Or I have multiple properties. And um, so typically it's per occurrence, but there might be a general aggregate. So in that example, each time you're sued, you have $2 million coverage. 
However, over the course of one year, you have an annual aggregate of two million as well. So if you get sued once for two million, you have no liability coverage on that property anymore. You have to uh, obtain it elsewhere, either through another policy, ask the insurance company to increase their aggregate, things like that. But if you have multiple properties on one policy, once we get into two, three, four, five properties, 10 properties, sometimes we have lots of properties on the same policy, we look at either increasing the aggregate or we look at bumping that up to 5 million in general because same situation if you have multiple students living in the house, um, you could have a situation where there's multiple tenants involved in a single claim. Um, you want to make sure you have an adequate limit per claim that per lawsuit that's coming against you. So if you have 2 million, definitely don't go lower than that. If you have a student rental, multiple properties, things like that, um, you should look at either an umbrella policy that might cover all of your properties. Sometimes that's a challenge depending on the different types of properties you have. Um, or you want to look at increasing the uh, minimum limit that you have per claim, the per occurrence limit. Uh, a lot of times it's not as much as people think, um, but definitely inquire about it. Find out what your options are and take, uh, you know, what's less money at the end of the day, $2 million or $200 a year to pay out of your pocket in the event that you have multiple claims against you, right? So Yeah, yeah, you are covering your butt at the end of the day with this stuff. Uh, insurance does have a purpose for yeah. a reason. But yeah. um, so you mentioned there, if you have multiple properties under one policy, are you talking yeah. about an umbrella policy? Uh, no, so a lot of times you can have multiple locations on one policy. You can have location one, location two, and it's all your rental properties on one policy. Um, sometimes it makes sense to do. We typically... How do you determine if it makes sense or doesn't make sense to do something like that? There's a few factors. Um, a lot of times um, you don't want to spread that liability limit too thin if you have multiple properties. But sometimes it boils down to something as simple as people have different bank accounts for each property. Um, when there's multiple properties on one policy, it typically has to come out as one withdrawal per month. We send you a breakdown of what you're paying per location, um, but people say, no, I want to have, I have a bank account for each property. That's, so you can't do it. I'll, uh, that's um, realistically sometimes the, uh, the reason why people have multiple properties because they want to have everything separate for accounting, for their own tracking purposes. Yeah, is it advantageous to have multiple properties under one policy? Sometimes they're saving. Years ago, there used there used to be more uh, deeper discounts for having multiple properties on each policy. We've seen companies kind of get away from that because uh, it was affecting their bottom line at the end of the day. If you can, um, I would recommend separate policies per location. Yeah. Some people like to manage to handle it all once once a year. They you know there's five locations oh, on one nice. policy yeah but there's pros and cons to both so um same thing we can have a conversation about that or you have that conversation with your insurance broker agent okay there's pros and cons to both so now maybe an umbrella policy would be the better fit if you get into um especially if you have some people you know you can extend the uh rental property off of your primary residence you can just add it as location that might be a situation where you want to have some excess liability or umbrella liability. Um, and a lot of times it's really cheap. Few, Sorry, if you're combining your personal residence with rentals? Yeah, so sometimes you'll have your home and auto or just your home with one company and you can actually add rental properties to that policy and have them as additional locations. But same thing, it's gonna come out as one withdrawal. But if you only have 2 million liability on your primary residence to cover your own personal liability and you have three rental properties on that policy, you want to have some excess liability for the same reason. If you have a claim against you or multiple claims, you want to make sure that you're not exhausting your liability limit that you have okay. uh, on the policy. So I've so I've got two million here. It's a student rental. You think that's fine, or you think you know if you really want to be safe and cover yourself, go up to five million? Yeah, I mean, two million seems to be the industry standard right now. And that used to be a million, right? Uh, yeah. So when I was, so I came into the industry about 2010. That seemed to be when things were really, people were saying, you need a higher limit now. You need a higher limit. As you know, as society gets more litigious and people are suing people for everything these days, 
there's no number to say is safe. Like I, I can't, you know, sit here today and say, yeah, no, you're definitely absolutely covered enough. The doctor example being a perfect example, like a doctor could sue you for $10 million. Like what you have to find that balance between what you, you know, at the end of the day, it's really, it's using your, the information you have to make the best estimate as to what are your exposures? What are you going to be sued for? What's the likeliness of something happening? There's no insurance is definitely not a science and insuring your property isn't a science. It's taking all the information that you can get and making a decision as to what is most likely going to happen. I mean, at the end of the day, we don't see liability lawsuits every day. Um, on properties, we see sewer backup, we see fire, we see stuff like that. However, when we do see liability lawsuits, they're much larger. They're much more drastic, right? Than so, 2 million? Then, um, I mean, I don't see a ton because a lot of times that stuff is handled and settled by the insurance company directly. We, we have access to that information, but um, 2 million is what I would say is the industry standard these days. Um, we can explore higher options to see if that makes economic sense to you. Um, or to anyone really. Um, but definitely don't go lower than that is what I'm saying. Um, okay. But assess your situation, right? Yeah. So the umbrella policy you mentioned, it can work when you're lumping home and auto and rental together. Um, but what about if you're just lumping rental together? Does it make sense? There is options out there for uh, standalone umbrella or excess liability policies. Yeah. Like someone was telling me, you know, giving me general advice. Yep. Funny to get your opinion on this. They're like, yeah, like for like an extra, maybe 50 bucks, you could get an umbrella thrown on your, your three properties and then you're covered for much more. Yeah. So how, um, and I mean, every policy is different and, and standard disclaimer, speak to your broker or agent, but a lot of times you can obtain an excess or umbrella policy. There's a slight difference. Um, you know, you, we can talk about that another uh, another time. But basically, what you can you can obtain as a policy is just a liability policy. And if you exhaust the limits, so you could have a policy, an excess liability or umbrella liability for two million or three million or five million or whatever. If you're sued for three million and you exhaust the two million on your policy, that's when those policies kick in to pick up the extra. And what it does though, is it extends to all your policies. So you have your base 2 million or 5 million on those policies. Once those limits are exhausted, then you have this policy that kind of, that's why they call it kind of an umbrellas over everything, um, or it's excess liability more than what you have on your policy. But a lot of times they, they want to see you exhaust that limit on your policy. Those policies aren't primary. This policy, your standard policy is going to be your primary policy and pay out initially in the event of a claim. And then you can have those other policies to cover your other exposures or the limit above and beyond what you have on your policy. Okay. Uh, so liability, we can kind of quickly burn through this one. Uh, you already mentioned each occurrence limit. Yep. Um, products completed operations. So yeah. So a lot of that stuff doesn't really apply to rental properties because it's uh, a general wording used for lots of businesses. Okay. Let's just skip it. Then. Yeah. So the easiest way I'll sum it up in kind of a few words here, it's third party liability. So any sort of third party lawsuit against you for bodily injury or property damage is what that coverage is designed. So someone sues you for damage to them themselves a slip and fall most common or damage to their property while on your premises. That's what that, that uh, coverage is designed to, uh, to ensure most commonly slip and fall or some sort of while, bodily while injury your property. Well, on the, on your premises. Yeah. So that's a third party, like a contractor comes over and could be anything, could be your tenant, could be the mailman slips on ice, could be a contractor. Um, they have to prove that you are negligent but there is defense costs associated with defending yourself in a lawsuit that would be picked up as well. So, okay. So this is a good question. So what a lot of landlords do is ask their tenants to take care of snow removal. Right. So in the winter time, maybe they give them a shovel or whatever, but ultimately like the onus is on you at the landlord tenant board to exactly. be one taking care of it though. Yep. You can ask your tenant. So what happens right. if the mailman walks up to the door, slips, falls because they didn't put salt on the driveway yep. or, or use the shovel to remove the ice or snow and then they sue you, Yep. how does that work? Can they prove negligence if you haven't provided, let's say your tenant with the, the proper materials to, to like salt and a shovel? 
so like you said, at the end of the day, the responsibility lies on the landlord. Um, what you need to know or what you need to remember is in the event uh, that we'll use the mailman, he comes on your property, he slips on ice, breaks his leg, he's suing you. Uh, his lawyer is most likely going to name anyone and everyone. A good lawyer is going to name the landlord, the tenant, probably yeah, they the throw city, everyone on, like everyone, see what right? Sticks, right? Exactly. So um, that's, a, that's a great phrase because see what sticks. What a judge is going to most likely do is so he's going to sit there and look at it and say the tenant may or may not have insurance there's no there's no money to access there you know you could put a uh a, a, a judgment against the tenant for a million dollars you're not going to get that money out of the, that person right what he's going to do is say okay yeah the landlord what did the landlord do to to defer his negligence or defer his responsibility or defer his negligence in this situation. So if you're like, oh, well, I have a separate agreement with the tenant. He's responsible for snow removal, uh, cutting the grass, putting salt down, whatever the case may be. Here's the agreement. In that agreement, it says that he needs to obtain coverage for his responsibilities. That can be a challenge, whole nother can of worms, but, um, or you've hired a third party to do that and they can't do it. So the judge says, well, yeah, you know, they've done their part. They're still contributory negligent is what we call it in this situation because they weren't checking in on it or weren't enforcing it. But and judges can do whatever they want. Um, if you, if you look into that, uh, you know, into the, the legal side of it, but they're going to most likely look for the deep pockets in the situation, right? So they're going to look for all the, you know, um, Anthony has a $2 million liability policy. Uh, at the end of the day, this was his property. Um, the mailman's looking for a million dollars to cover, you know, all his legal expenses and, you know, his life's been affected. Let's just get this done. We're going to award a million dollars against Anthony to the insured. The policy picks it up. It's a done deal. Everyone's happy. Right. Um, but you're going to get named in the lawsuit. And your the insurance company's legal team on your behalf is going to have to determine what you did to not make yourself liable or, or negligent in this situation. So, right? so how would the insurance company look at this? Would they be because let's say they are, you know, you're guilty as charged. You got to pay the two million dollars. Yep. And that's coming from the insurance company. Yep. But now I assume they're going to be trying to shirk all of that responsibility and say, you as the landlord are the one responsible for this. You didn't hire someone like a third party company to do this. Now you owe us $2 million. No. So that's what the insurance policy is designed is to cover your, your negligence, um, whether it was intentional or not, or any reward against you for a third party bodily injury or property damage in the event of a claim against you. Um, that's what the policy is designed to do. Now they may, what we call subrogate back against any other responsible parties if they can. So if you had some sort of agreement to, um, showing that a, a third party contractor was responsible, things like that, they can try to behind the scenes, go back and go after recover them. their money, but it's all done away from, but they're not going to come after you. No, they, they're not going to come again, uh, back against you, or they're going to deny the claim from their standpoint. If you were doing something criminal or something like that, obviously doesn't apply in this situation, but as long as you're following the law, following uh, the rules, being a reasonable person, the policy is designed to cover you for third party bodily injury or property damage lawsuits against you. Okay. So, all right, I, we started this like two minutes ago and I was like, damn, I need to get a snow company based on this. But now I'm like, do I need to? We're seeing companies, as we're seeing some insurance companies require that a third party contractor licensed and insured is responsible for snow removal, but not every company is requiring it. Best practice or best advice from an insurance standpoint would be to either handle it yourself if, you know, if you're local uh, your property manager a lot of times can do that, but the key is logging and documenting when when stuff is done and how it was done. So if you've put the onus on another on a third party, either a professional snow removal company or a property manager, get them to log when it was done. You know, because the the weather records will show 
oh, it snowed at 1.30, this is how much it snowed. Okay, at, at two o'clock, uh, the, the property manager was there, shoveled, sanded, salted, and you know everyone's got a phone these days, here's a picture, like everything looks done. Where you get into um, problems is when you can't show that it was done and that it was done regularly, it was done at a reasonable, in a reasonable time frame, right? And that's where the benefit of the doubt from a legal standpoint, from a judge standpoint, is probably going to go to the affected party. But if you can show and prove, and, and it's not going to completely, you know, absolve you from being responsible. But if you can provide, hey, every time it snows, my my property manager or my um, snow removal company, they're you know they're there within an hour or they're there in thirty minutes. Here's all the documentation. The driveway was salted. It was shoveled. What was this guy doing, right? And a lot of times, um, that's one of the biggest causes of fraud too. And uh, you know, I'm not accusing anyone of doing anything, but the reality is, is we see people faking these slip and falls. We see people doing stuff like that. So if you can't back up that this person is either I can so I can see why the insurance companies are requiring this because ultimately it protects them. Exactly. Because you're protected. At the end of the day, the insurance companies, the reality is that they're going to look out for their bottom line, which is paying claims. And um, from my experience, they they are fair and reasonable when in fair and reasonable situations. Um, okay, so let's say this happens. So yep. so I have, I've asked my tenants to do the snow removal. Right. Um, some, uh, you know, they don't do it or they were yep. too, too slow getting to it or whatever. So the mailman goes, slips, falls, cracks his head. Yep. He sues, he gets, he throws it at, you know, lumps all of us in there. Yep. Tenants probably not going to have to pay anything. Um, I'm lumped in there and the insurance company's lumped in there. Because well, you're lumped in there with the insurance. The insurance company is providing the coverage on your behalf, right? Okay. So. And they win the lawsuit. And yep. as long as it's under $2 million, I'm okay. Exactly. If he sues for $2.5 million and that's what their reward is against him, or even, sometimes you even have to, anything over and above the $2 million, you might have to defend yourself. Uh, you might be financially responsible for that amount over and above. That's definitely a possibility. What we see or what I've seen from researching these cases and stuff like that, the judge is gonna try to work within, he might award the 2 million knowing that that doesn't, the additional amount doesn't come out of yeah, your pocket. Like he's not taking out this, this. But there are situations where, especially if it involves children, people with uh, high, high income earners, um, where their life is impacted beyond where that, you know, that 2 million is not going to take care of them their entire life. Maybe they need 24, they become a, a paraplegic or something like that. Unfortunately, the judge might award them 10 million. You might, you know, you, that anything over and above that 2 million could be, you know, your wages could be garnished for the rest of your life. Right. So there is situations and obviously we don't see those every day, but when they do happen, it is a reality that it could happen, right? So don't lose sleep over a night that, you know, you're going to be sued for $10 million tomorrow, but um, just be aware and, and do be proactive and do your due diligence when it comes to property management, avoiding hazards on your property, avoiding dangerous situations, and be aware of your liability limit and what your options are to increase that. And if it makes sense or if you should be doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this makes me think instead of just shovels, which I've been providing my tenants, I need to also provide them with salt. Well, and the key to, because fairly inexpensive, exactly. um, could avoid this situation, but the key is regular maintenance and logging and documenting when this is done, because that's gonna show that you've done your due diligence on your end in the event of a claim. So it's great that, that you know the tenant could be the best shoveler and, and salter in the world, but if you can't prove that that was done, then it's, he said, she said at the end of the day, right? So it takes two seconds to snap a picture of beautiful shovel, shovel driveway, salted, done 20 minutes after it was finished, finished snowing or done right away. Then it looks like you've done what a reasonable person would do to prevent a slip and fall. And mm -hmm. that can help limit the impact of a, of a claim, right? So even on like, I'm just thinking your own home. Yep. 
Same thing. Exactly. You, you same would want to do the same thing. Absolutely. So a lot it of seems times, like paranoid, but so I mean, obviously, I have uh, maybe a different mindset or a different. Do you do uh, it? I, I shovel religiously as soon as I can. But uh, what I also have is a simple camera that shows my driveway and the sidewalk. So in the event of a slip and fall, it's been documented. Right. So, I mean, did you get the camera just because of that? Uh, it was one of the, you know, it's one of the to reasons. keep an eye on my property when I'm not there. Yes. Yeah, but, um, I have, uh, I live in a townhouse. I have a, uh, very busy sidewalk, busy, very busy street. So, I mean, cameras aren't going to prevent people from doing stuff. They, they don't prevent people from breaking into your car. They don't prevent people from, but I can do it. breaking into your house, but, uh, it, it does help deter from to an extent. Um, but it just documents at least what happened. I mean, as we know, a lot of times you see these security footage and you don't know who that person is. Like, good luck trying to find the person who broke into your house or whatever. But in a slip and fall situation, um, or, you know, someone tries to break into your car and cuts their hand. We've seen people sue people, sue the insurance company for, for the damages, even though they shouldn't have been doing that. And there's no, nothing saying that they're not going to have a reward against them. Right. It's, it's crazy what you see people sue for, but they're suing the car owner. Yeah. We've seen crazy stuff like that. Not that they, and it's not saying that they won't be awarded anything, but you still have to defend your innocence. Right. Yeah. Um, but slip and fall. Uh, the, one of the main reasons I have the camera or the cameras, um, and you know, you obviously have to be careful about what you're filming and not filming in public, but what do you mean by that? Um, I, and I'm not an expert on privacy laws or what you're allowed to film publicly, privately consult a lawyer for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, like I can't have a camera going into my neighbor's house, right? Things like that. That's a whole different, we won't get into that, but well, so I'm just wondering now if it's worth putting like a, one of those, uh, door cameras, doorbell cameras or front door camera, whatever you call it. Um, on a rental property that would be, you know, you have to discuss obviously what your tenants are comfortable with, but yeah. Cause um, then the tenants are just going to think that the landlord's spying. And yeah, exactly. There's, there's laws and things you have to follow in regards to that. Uh, especially when it comes to, uh, um, short-term rentals and stuff, you know, people want to, they want to keep an eye on things as best as possible. Um, but aside from, from investment properties, things like that, documentation is key because you just have to show that you're doing what a reasonable person what should be doing or shouldn't be doing in any situation. And that's going to help you the most in the event of a, a lawsuit against you, but consult a lawyer for any sort of legal advice. But, um, uh, on your own residence, you know, if someone's going to say they slipped and fell cause you didn't shovel the driveway, do what you can to prove that you did what you're supposed to do. Okay. Uh, medical payments limit. So that's kind of like a goodwill payment in the event that there's some sort of bodily injury or property damage in that situation, probably be bodily injury. You actually don't need to get sued for that coverage to kick in. So if someone broke their ankle, needs some physio, OHIP's not covering it, they're private to if they have private uh, medical coverage and covering it. And they come to you and say, you know, I've had $3,000 in physio um, or medical coverages. So one I want you to reimburse that or I'm going to sue you. The insurance company could pay those coverages with the intention that that person's not going to sue you for, uh, for potentially more money. So it's kind of a goodwill payment that's built in there to kind of hopefully minimize a larger um, situation. Cool. Yeah. It says any one person, 2,500 each occurrence, 10,000. And so you'll see little, various uh, different limits on that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, so nothing major, but just uh, here's this, here's some money. That's how the coverage works. I've never seen a claim typically because we have OHIP in Ontario. So if you have to go, uh, uh, you're covered you know, for, for most stuff, or you have a combination of that and some sort of private insurance plan that is going to cover a lot of those costs, but it is there. Okay. Personal and advertising injury limit doesn't really apply in this situation. That's more of a generic coverage that's built into this wording that applies to all the business that the insurance company does. Okay. Tenants, legal liability name, uh, limit any one premises. So that's something that a lot of people see and they assume they have coverage either for the tenants, but that coverage actually only applies if you are a tenant, same thing. It's a coverage that is generically used by the insurance company for all their business. So 
You can ignore it. Ignore it. Yeah. Okay. And then property damage deductible endorsement, 2 million. Um, so that's just the property, uh, any damage. It's the deductible that applies in, in a claim, uh, for a liability for a third party property damage against you. So yeah, so there is a deductible if you are to get sued, uh, it's a thousand dollars. So it's basically there any sort of claim on the policy. There's a minimum thousand dollar deductible. Okay. So s- property damage though. So third party property damage could be, why is that under liability? Not, th- um, because it's third party. So, um, say you have a tree on your property, it falls and your tenants have put up a, a shed or they have a patio furniture or something. There's a million examples, but um, th- it's not your property, but, so it's third party's property, but it's damaged. So it's not covered under your property because it's not your property. Um, they could sue you for, now if it hits a car, auto insurance is completely different, but. An example would be they've put up a shed in the backyard that you don't own, uh, patio furniture, any sort of property that they own that could be damaged in the event of a claim. They sue you for that. The property damage uh, to their property is covered under oh, your liability. So now coverage. I see the liability part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you report a claim? My best advice to keep that simple Just is talk to your broker. Talk to your broker. If it's an emergency, um, I mean, most situations, like if your house is on fire or, um, you're going to call the fire department, you're not going to call us first. And typically within normal business hours, we can ha- do what needs to be done. A lot of times, if it's something drastic, your basement is filling up with water. Um, a pipe has burst call. I mean, the majority of times it's going to be covered in a situation like that. Call us. We should be available during normal business hours. Um, there is a lot of times 1-800 numbers for companies. I believe it's in the back of those policies. Um, but get someone on site because it's got to be handled either way, whether it's an insured loss or not insured loss. Get a plumber on site. Um, get someone there that can stop the damage right away. A, a, a key piece of information to keep in mind when it comes to water damage stuff Know where, know where how to turn off the water to your house. Know where the main water shutoff valves are. Show your tenants how to turn toilets off. Because a lot of times that can be done and that can stop small situations from becoming big situations, right? And a lot of people, I mean, I myself, until I owned a house, didn't know how to turn off the water to the house. Didn't know how to turn off toilets. So if you can do little things like that to stop, to prevent it become bigger problems, it's going to help yourself and everyone in the long run. Yeah. A quick tip on that, that I figured out is to print. I just went on like Google images yep. and I searched up like water valve shut off sign. I printed it out on just like an eight by 11 piece of paper and laminated it at Staples yep. and then uh, taped it to right where the water shut off is showed the tenants. And then another thing I do is I do make like an evergreen video that I can always resend uh, right. new tenants and especially with student rentals because there's so much higher turnover. Yep. So every time new new tenants move in, I send them this video where I showed them where the main water shut off is, how to clean out the lint trap and the dryer, everything they need to know about the home, uh, all this stuff. And, and it helps a lot. Um because they don't have to try and find the valve themselves. You know, you're trying to explain over the phone exactly. where it is. It's like, show them, send them a video, you know, show them in person, you know, how to change the furnace filter, stuff yep. like that. But put the sign, even like student rental, non-student rental, whatever, just put the sign there. That is invaluable information because that's going to prevent probably 90%. It, it's either going to l- make what we normally see as big problems, especially when it comes to water small problems um, and prevent a lot of stuff like the one of the most common fire claims we see in student rentals is lint build up in dryers because they've never you know mom and dad have done that and they've never done it they don't even know what it is or that it needs to be done yeah and that stuff builds up especially student rental washer dryers probably run in every night for one reason or another and that just builds up quickly and when that catches on fire, fire is obviously fire and water become big problems quickly if they're not mitigated or dealt with 
so that that is huge that that can be invaluable to a to a property yeah cool i i even put a little waste basket beside the thing that i buy just on amazon yeah exactly like, here's the waste basket and in the video here's how you actually clean it and then yep. put it in the waste basket and then i have made another sign for that and the signs right on the dryer and it's like clean uh lint trap after every use That's... try to explain the importance of the fires and um, another one actually another tip just while i'm going on these is put um uh, the water shut off for the outdoor taps yep. that you want to close up yep. uh, before winter because that tap leads inside the home and uh, because it's exposed to the outside, right. the water can freeze, expand, burst that, and then there'd be a flood inside the home yep. from that bursting. So you want to make sure that's closed. Either your tenant does it and confirms with you or even better, you go for like an inspection, right. do it yourself, but put a sign there so your tenant knows where it is. Yep. So in the springtime, maybe you don't have to go back to the property they can just open it up themselves. And what we see there a lot of times with in those situations is that's not a problem the first year when it, um, that's something that creates a big problem because it, it progressively gets worse year after year. So maybe there was a little drip um, cause that wasn't done properly and the tenants thinking, oh, whatever the, the faucet just leaks low, but there's actually something bigger going on, but you don't know it's now the water's off for the winter spring fires up they got the hose going they got different stuff now it's a huge problem because that's been eroding or getting worse over the winter um, so doing little proactive maintenance like that prevents probably 90 percent of claims that we we see if you do the little things all those things you just mentioned okay i'll keep going so in the yeah. bathrooms i have signs and i'm like especially for this only for student rentals do i have these ones where i'm like don't flush. It's a sign I just found on Google Images. Rockstar members, actually, these are all available on the toolbox on the awesome. member site. If you're a Rockstar member, you can just go and you know print off all these signs that I made. Um, but it's a, it's a sign. It says, don't flush condoms, uh, tampons, Q-tips, uh, anything that's not toilet paper, do not flush it. And it seems like a simple thing, but just print it out, laminate it at Staples, stick it on the wall beside each toilet in the home. And then beside the kitchen sink, I have a sign, uh, no food stuff down the drain. It's just little reminders to these kids that hadn't, haven't never had to maintain their right. home, deal with the consequences of doing these things. Yeah, exactly. Just to remind them, you know, yep. no bacon grease down the drain, you know, all that type of stuff. Okay. So let's, we are already going pretty long here. Let's uh, just hammer through the rest sure. of these things. Yeah. I think they're short ones anyways. Um, What's Aegis, Aegis cyber exclusion, A-E-G-I-S? So cyber liability is a whole nother uh, ball game. It's not including any sort of cyber incidents that go against you. So not really applicable in this situation, but if you were a business that got hacked. This is like cyber warfare stuff. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exclusion of asbestos related claims. Is that common to exclude asbestos stuff? Yeah. So any sort of... Uh, I'll kind of lump a few here together, mold, asbestos, things like that. Do your due diligence when buying a property, do your proper maintenance, anything mold related, because it's not something that occurs sudden and accidentally mold related stuff is not excluded. And that's any policy, your home, your primary home, different stuff like that. Okay. A legal substance exclusion. So any sort of, um, you know, grow ops, different stuff like that. If you're doing something illegal or criminal, the insurance company is not going to cover you for anything. Or your tenants. Exactly. Okay, this is actually, yeah, I didn't even think about this. How important is it for landlords to regularly do home inspections? So you're finding out things like, is there a grow up in my rental? Yeah, so be very careful with that stuff. Um, not saying that some resulting damage may or may not be covered, um, but there's always the chance that an insurance company will have an exclusion in there that doesn't cover certain certain claims one being grow ops same thing because at the end of the day you're responsible for knowing what's going on in your property some things you can or cannot prevent but you know there's there's uh policies and procedures in place for you as a landlord that allow you to keep an eye on things to an extent use those to your advantage to make sure that nothing illegal or criminal is going on in the property okay so these rental inspections are they required in most rental property insurance policies that you do like let's say a biannual inspection sometimes you'll see that they want to see a responsible party whether it's you or a third party inspecting the property it could be annually monthly every six months if there's something like that 
we pass that on to the client and let you them share know. it. But uh, best practices, you know, if you ideally, if you can have someone in there every 30 days, um, even just uh, an exterior ex- exterior inspection, making sure the roof is in good working condition, making sure that there's no hazards outside the property. Um, 30 days seems really excessive. It does seem excessive, I mean, but it, it could it be as simple as even this, even a tenant uh, sending you a picture of the outside showing, you know, there's, you know, the property's free of any clutter. The, the railing stairs are in good working condition. The roof looks like it's in good shape. Something yeah, as simple I do as think that. if you can drive by it, you know, as frequently as you can. Um, exactly. But uh, yeah, every month though to go inside the property, what tenant would want to deal with? That? We don't see. We don't see typically interior. It's typically not mandatory. So it's Hi, not, highly it's not recommend common. it. No, and and um, um, I've never really seen a, a claim excluded because someone didn't, you know, do a full inspection on this property every thirty days, but. Um, some policies just have a lot, a lot of times, not a lot of times there can be a clause that states a responsible party is at least it's in, uh, inspecting the exterior every 30 days. Like I said, if it's in there, we'll let you know about it. Okay. Yeah. I like to go biannually. Yeah. I think and do know, a good, every uh, three thorough. to six months is a, is yeah. a good time slot. Maybe yep. three times a year you go every four yep. months. I like biannually. I go spring and then right before winter. And then I can see, you know, the full exterior of the home. Things aren't covered in snow. Right. And I can do my before and after winter yep. kind of check-ins, like turning off those outdoor taps. Right. That type of stuff. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, wood or coal burning appliance? Uh, it doesn't really apply unless you have some sort of wood stove in your property. Yeah. Your so that's an exclusion. Like that. so yeah. yeah unless covered. they know about it. Uh, Smoke and carbon monoxide detector warranty. Simply put, make sure you're following local bylaws, provincial bylaws, when it comes to smoke detectors and carbon monoxide, I think it legally it's one per floor, or one per room, depending on when the house was built or yeah. New building code. It's yeah. like one inside every bedroom. There you go. Old building yeah. code. It's like outside of the bedroom, right? One on each level. There you go. One in the furnace room. If you're following local bylaws, if you have any questions call just call your fire department. I've had clients do that and they'll let you know exactly what you need. And if you're following that, you won't be in violation of that uh, exclusion. Okay. Another thing is those things like expire every like 10 years or so, and you're supposed to replace the whole unit, right? Right. A lot. So a lot of, uh, especially on the new builds, it's hardwired into the house. Um, include that in your inspection, just test them, you know, hit the button. If they're not working, a lot of times uh, the company that produces them will replace them free of charge. So yeah. uh, they are expensive, but a lot of times you're, if you're within that 10 year frame, they're going to replace them for you. Uh, just call the company. That's on a new build. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. Okay. The ones that are hardwired into the house, a lot of times they have a 10 year warranty and 10 year expiry date, but if they're malfunctioning for any reason, um, I did it on my primary residence. One was malfunctioning. I called them. They sent me a new one, no charge. Oh, okay. um, cool. But, uh, yeah, keep an eye on those. Um, one thing maintenance on those, a lot of times if you just blow them with air, or vacuum them out, have your tenants do that, or you do that, that prevents them from malfunctioning a lot of times, apparently. Oh, really? Just like some comp- a compressed air can? Yeah, or even a vacuum to get the suction. A lot of times the dirt or uh, dust, or if they're in cooking areas, they get like the grease, the grease and stuff built up uh, and they malfunction and you'll hear them chiming or going off in the middle of the night and yeah. saves you a lot of headaches. Okay. Uh, biological or chemical materials exclusion? Uh, so same thing. There can't be any sort of like biohazardous chemicals stored on the property yeah. same thing doesn't really apply to okay, no nuclear properties. waste allowed on the property yeah exactly uh cyber and data endorsements same thing yeah um, okay cyber stuff cancellation clause uh so that's just making sure that um you need to give the insurance company notice if you want to cancel the policy they'll give you the standard uh, anywhere between 14 and 30 days notice if they're canceling you for non-renewal or you've been in violation of the policy somehow and they want to cancel you. But if you're being a reasonable person, you don't have to worry about that. But if they want to cancel you for claims experience or change in occupancy, they'll typically give you a minimum 14 days to find coverage elsewhere. Okay. Electronic data endorsement. Uh, same thing. It's not going to cover any sort of loss to computers and things like that. Uh, under Lloyd's underwriters, policyholders complaint protocol. Uh, so yeah. And any policy, if you have an issue with how your broker's handling it or an issue with the policy that you feel is not being handled by your broker, 
there's a procedure you can contact the insurance company. It's just like a consumer protection kind of okay. thing. Okay, I've got you accountable here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't know about that one, man. Uh, microorganism exclusion. Uh, so same thing. That's like uh, mold and funguses not going to be covered. Yeah. Coronavirus exclusion. So we've seen that uh, as a result of coronavirus. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of class action lawsuits going on right now against insurance companies um, for loss of income, things like that because they weren't able to operate their business because of coronavirus. Really? Uh, yeah, there's a big one going on against uh, Viva Insurance. If you Google it, it's uh, in quite the interesting case. But basically, if you can't operate your house, um, anything related to coronavirus, it's not covered. It doesn't really apply so to So these businesses weren't but, allowed to operate. Right, as we know, right? A yes. lot of businesses got shut down by the government. But isn't that the government's liability? That's not what this whole company? lawsuit, because you have business income or rental income coverage before coronavirus. There's a debate on... Who's liable? On is the insurance company required to pay this as a loss of business income to companies... I'll yeah, keep no, my opinion. I'll keep my opinions to yeah, Justin myself. Trudeau should be the one live. I feel terrible for what uh, you know a lot of restaurants or retail businesses the had to go through. Destruction of the economy. Exactly. However, they've made it more black and white as to what's covered and not covered. Yeah. Basically anything coronavirus is not covered. Um, but if you're looking for a good read, look into the uh ongoing class action lawsuits against uh, insurance companies. It's pretty crazy. Oh God. Uh, notice concerning personal information. Uh, that's just like uh, privacy information. Okay. Uh, stuff. Some with, of these, yeah, we're keeping your information private. Okay. So, um, let's just skim through these seepage and population. Uh, so see, yeah. Po pollution population. Yeah. Seepage so it, pollution. if there's any sort of, if you're causing any sort of pollution, um, I guess the biggest one to be aware of, if you have an oil tank on your property is oil heating your property, um, make sure everything's good to go and up to code and on that, and that you're not um, polluting the environment or the property in any way, because uh, you could be held liable by either the government or, or if you're polluting other properties, um, that's not included. You'd have to uh, obtain that coverage separately. Long story short, if you have an oil tank, um, make sure it's working. If it's not, replace it. If you haven't, it's working and you're concerned about it polluting, uh, look into potentially obtaining pollution coverage. You can't get it after obviously an incident, but if you're concerned about that, look into pollution coverage. Okay, sanction, limitation, and exclusion clause? Um, I believe that has to do with how long, uh, just with filing claims and doing it in a reasonable amount of time. A lot of these are, are long-winded wordings okay, no problem communicable disease exclusion uh so any sort of uh lawsuit or anything against you or anything involving communicable diseases coronavirus would probably be tied into that aren't, yeah. aren't covered okay uh war so there's a war one in addition to yeah so it kind of ties in with the terrorism one anything, yeah and then uh, there's a nuclear incident exclusion yeah, I so think like if, if we have a nuclear incident, you're not going to be, none of us are going to be uh, talk. But yeah, same thing. If there's uh, a nuclear incident and okay. your property's not operable, it's it's not covered. Okay, now one I don't see here and it is, so one time somebody called the office and okay. um, they were interested in like rejoining Rockstar as a member. Yep. And the reason they had um, stopped being a member is because a tornado had hit Barry. Right. And hit their rental property yeah. and a few other rent, uh, properties on, on that street. Now, this guy was saying, luckily, he had wind coverage. Right. So it was specifically wind coverage. It wasn't like tornado coverage, I don't think. He said it was wind coverage. And so he was covered. But then he was saying a neighbor of his didn't have it covered. And the home was like destroyed and they were on the hook for it. So I don't think we have all the information in that situation. Um, but typically a tornado is considered a wind event covered under any policy that I've seen. So kind of fire, wind, hail, um, smoke damage. Those are kind of like your base coverages on even the most basic of policies. Um, I obviously can't speak to that situation. Yeah, yeah. But so like I'm covered on that on this one? Yeah, like at, at the end of the day, tornado is just a really big windstorm. Windstorm is on 
any policy that I've seen. So don't sweat tornadoes. Okay, perfect. Let's go through some of the things that you had here yeah. uh, that you wanted to get the word out to investors. Um, fire protection. We're seeing a lot of properties in smaller towns or isolated areas, uh, cottages, rentals. So we've seen um, uh, cottages, short-term rentals that become, as you know, really popular, especially when COVID started, people were, were scooping those up. Um, but a lot of times they're in little towns that have, uh, you know, like full-time or their, the fire department is volunteer 100%. And the response time uh, using uh, what we call the fire underwriter survey. So that that's a program we have, um, not just using the insurance industry, but it gives the response time, estimated response time for the fire department to show up to your house. In any urban area, it's, it's quick. That's kind of like their best rating. But a lot of times in these uh, isolated or rural areas, cottage areas, it's very long, could be 20 minutes, 30 minutes, right? Um, and people make an assumption about what the insurance will cost, but a lot of times the biggest factor in those situations is the fire response time. So the rates are noticeably higher and people are kind of surprised or shocked by it. So just have that in the back of your mind when you're buying one of these properties, the insurance might be higher than what you expect because one factor being the fire department response time in that area is not high so in the event of a fire it's most likely going to be like a total loss on the property right so okay then you have a note here material changes so um, everyone should notify their insurance broker if there's a change in occupancy like a single family home to students or unrelated individuals like boarding house yeah uh, vacancy usually only an issue after 30 days so most policies allow uh, 30 days vacancy, they, they expect turnover. You know, you're going to want to paint, do flooring, look for new tenants. Um, so a lot of times you're allowed 30 days vacancy. The coverage, sometimes the coverage is minimized automatically. Sometimes it's not until after the 30 days. Just educate yourself on what the vacancy policy and procedures and conditions are on your policy. Because the insurance policy or company sees not having anyone in the property is more of a liability because there's no one to ma maintain things or watch over it. So uh, a few of the main reasons is becomes more attractive to break in thefts when if people are keeping an eye on the property and realize no one's there, okay, they can break in and do as they choose. If a pipe bursts or there's water damage, it becomes a big problem because water could be pumping in for days before anyone or weeks before anyone realizes. Um, and uh, yeah, same thing. There may not be anyone there to generally manage the property, you know, mow the grass, shovel, salt. So if uh, the property is going to be vacant for an extended period of time, just let us know. A lot of times um, it, it will reduce the amount of coverage when it comes to water damage or certain things on the policy. Sometimes it won't, um, but a lot of people are unaware of what needs to be done. So as long as you have an idea of how this works, you're going to avoid surprises and potentially claims that aren't covered um, if you just kind of educate yourself a bit. Okay. And then you have increase or decrease in rental income. We covered that. Plans to renovate, updates to heating, plumbing, electrical roof. Yeah. So a lot of times um, you you can get a better rate if the infrastructure of the house has been updated um, and people don't let us know um, or there'll be exclusions applied uh, when the roof hits a certain age and a lot of times we contact people and they're like, Oh, well, yeah, it was done a couple years ago. We just didn't let you know. And, uh, same thing with the plumbing electrical. Um, if they put a sump pump in, sometimes there's a discount for that. If they put a sewer backfill valve, sometimes there's a discount for that. They just forget to let us know. And the insurance company doesn't really go. They're not going to retroactively give you that discount. They'll apply it from when you let us know. So that can help sometimes offset increases and things like that. So it's more so like functional improvements to the property, the new hot water tank, the new sump pump, not cosmetic changes or... Sometimes too, like we come across properties um, that have aluminum wiring, fuses, stuff like that, that limits where we can go with insurance. They update that stuff. They don't let us know. And where we could have access to tons of markets with at better rates they're not getting access to that right away because we're under the impression still that it has these kind of limiting aspects of the house that uh don't let us do that so yeah anytime you change any sort of infrastructure to the house 
let us know because the majority of the time it's to your uh, advantage to do that. Okay. Monthly versus annual payments. Um, so a lot of people are under the impression that if you pay monthly, that you're just month to month in this insurance contract, but you're always typically speaking in an annual contract for the policy monthly. Sometimes there's a fee to pay. Sometimes there's not, but you're always in an annual contract is what people a lot of times don't understand. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? Do, 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 do. I think that's it. I have this other policy. We're already kind of going long here. We're almost two hours, yeah. Kyle. I mean, they're at the end of the day, they're essentially the same. Yeah. Um, what we can't stress enough is don't try to paint a different picture with the insurance company or your broker of what the property is actually being used for. You might save yourself some money, but at the end of the day, most likely a claim would be denied. Um, just let us know what you're doing with the property. We have solutions for that. Um, okay. Uh, Kyle, what's a reasonable inflation rate of policies and, and what's, what's that inflation based on? We've seen, unfortunately, the cost of building materials, labor, things like that skyrocket since uh, COVID started and not seem to come down as back to pre-COVID levels. So we've seen property rebuild values increase drastically, which affects the rates um, accordingly. Um, so I know we've had to have a lot of tough conversations with clients and explain what's going on, but um, make sure your property is insured. Unfortunately, we've seen rates go up. Do what you can with deductibles, doing improvements to the house, things like that. Have a discussion with your broker or agent as to what what you can do to reduce the cost if you're seeing your costs go up. Um, but we have seen costs go up. That's not out of the ordinary. Um, so kind of plan for that. Um, we are still seeing, as we all know, what are costs go kind of going up on a percentage basis? <sighs> it's really tough to say. Um, but it's like a minimum of 8% a year. Yeah. So a lot of companies these days are before it used to be every two, three years, they'd imply inflation to the building because we've seen that kind of going up every year. They're doing that every year to make sure that building is insured adequately. And they understand we want their premium for what they are potentially on risk for. Mm -hmm. So, um, but a lot, sometimes it can be offset by just doing a complete reevaluation of the house. Um, so on renewals, is it worth it to price shop every year? I don't think it's worth it every year because some companies offer like a disappearing deductible that increases every year as you are with the company. Um, the deductible gets smaller and smaller. Yeah, exactly. So that can be advantageous in the event of a claim. But I would say um, every three years maybe might be worth your while unless you've seen like an absolutely crazy increase. Um, find out why, first of all. Um, ask your broker to survey the market um, sometimes there's not a solution and d always find out if you're switching, what the difference are differences between the two policies, because yeah, you might save four or 500 bucks, but you've sacrificed some key coverages that are going to be more than that four or $500 in the event of a claim. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask you like, is it worth it to build a relationship with one insurance company, almost like you do with a bank? you know, over time, instead of just constantly switching. I think it's more important to build a relationship with your broker or agent mm. and make sure they understand what your goals are, what your comfort level are with deductibles, what your plan is if, to grow your portfolio. Um, and there can be some decisions made initially that will have better impact long-term than if you're just using like these direct companies online where you're not speaking to anyone or um, there's definitely some value in dealing with someone. Um, I mean, obviously I'm a little biased, but that is working with real estate all the time that knows you and what your intentions and what your plans are, what your um, comfort level is with an event of a claim. What, what do you want to pay out of pocket mm -hmm. um, and what your plan is um, for each individual property and for your portfolio uh, long term so that they can make some decisions or educate you on some information. Um, are there home insurance guys that just don't know much about commercial insurance, like rental property insurance specifically? I think there's value and a benefit to working with someone that at least 
deals with property on a regular basis, a lot of, not a lot but of especially brokers. Rental if you property. call a broker that, a brokerage that is just a general brokerage, and I mean, we're, oh, in the big picture, we are a general brokerage. We do in all types of business. Uh, but myself working in real estate a lot, I have a pretty good feel for what markets are doing, what's competitive coverage-wise, what's competitive cost-wise, what are little tweaks we can make to policies to make it work on both ends. Um, there is value in that. Not to yeah. say that someone who doesn't work in real estate doesn't understand this stuff, but just like any industry, yeah, working with a specialist has its value. Right? Yeah, totally. With real estate investing, it's like that with everything. Exactly. Your mortgage broker, your exactly. accountant, your yeah. lawyer, your paralegal, your, you want someone that's experienced with real estate investing. At the end of the day, it just makes it efficient for you. It saves you time, hopefully saves you money, um, and avoids the situation. It avoids surprises is what I find the most. Now, as a broker, how many different insurance companies do you have access to or relationships with? So we have access to the majority of property insurers in Ontario. So I'm licensed to work in Ontario. I deal with properties in Ontario. Um, just like any, just like a good mortgage broker, uh, uh, you're, you have, you know, your five or six go-to companies that are your solution. But in the event of something unique we we most likely have a solution for it i there is hasn't been a many properties where i was saying i don't have a solution that that uh like you should be getting the same answer everywhere but we have uh, those relationships built no different than a mortgage broker where when you're working with the same underwriters same companies you get answers a little quicker you know who to go to so it makes it efficient uh for everyone Okay. Is there, um, what, is there anything that most people don't understand about insurance or maybe common frustration points you have when speaking with people that they just don't understand? I think we kind of touched on them. Okay. Um, it's like maybe like, Hey, why are you more expensive than this policy? And you're trying to communicate, Oh, it's better coverage. That's why I think the biggest thing to keep in mind, um, and I, I shared that uh, kind of worksheet with you and by all means, anyone can reach out to me and I can provide to them or you can um, really dive into the coverages when you're comparing policies to each other. Because I think the biggest misconception people have is that all policies are built the same when they're not. And there can be some key factors that cause big financial problems and headaches in the event of a claim when you think you're saving money and getting the same policy when you're not, when sometimes it's worth the extra 10, 20, 30, 40, $50 a month to get some coverages that in the event of a claim, you're not paying anything out of pocket or you're just paying your deductible instead of paying. Like, I guess the biggest one I see, uh, sewer backup coverage. A lot of times people, Oh, I found this policy at $600 cheaper. They send it to me. They have $10,000 sewer backup, 15,000 at minimum. I would say you need twenty five to fifty thousand at least these days because emergency mitigation, getting fans in there, getting water cleaned up, getting stuff like that, you burn through fifteen, twenty thousand, no problem. And does so, that cover damage to like the carpet or yeah, flooring? exactly. Carpet, flooring, um, the emergent the initial emergency mitigation, getting the water cleaned up, getting fans in there, getting a plumber to kind of figure out what's going on or someone a professional in there to figure out what's going on. If you have ten or fifteen thousand dollars coverage and you have a basement that would the easiest way to look at it, what would it cost to turn your basement from an unfinished basement to a finished basement? I don't know a value of that square foot. You'd have to speak to a professional, but a value of two fifty to three fifty a square foot would probably not be unreasonable. So if you have a thousand dollar or a thousand foot basement or a thousand foot main floor, that's thirty five thousand um, minimum that you need, right? that you could potentially have to pay out of pocket, so. Okay, uh, do you insure homes with knob or tube or aluminum wiring? Uh, knob and tube can be a real challenge unless your plan is to get in there and do that right away, um, which is mostly typically the requirement in the event that, yeah, we're gonna buy this place and within 30 days, it's gonna be completely converted. Aluminum, we have some companies that will do that. A lot of times, generally speaking, you need some sort of ESA inspection or professional uh, electrical inspection to show that it's been, uh, you know, pigtailed properly or different things like that, to, to that it can handle the, cause a lot the aluminum just has uh, a lower threshold than copper wiring. 
So if, especially on a student rental, things like that, if you have a lot of usage on the electrical in the house, that's where that aluminum gets hot and starts fires compared to copper wiring. So a lot of times aluminum is not as much of a problem if it's been uh, inspected and shown that it can handle the, the workload of the house. Okay. So the answer is it kind of depends. It's more limiting uh, your options from an insurance standpoint. And you'll probably pay a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just as a consumer, as an investor specifically, someone who's getting all these different properties, their own prop, their principal residence, you know, car, multiple cars in the family, what's the best way of setting up insurance? Is it, you know, starting with your primary home and, and, uh, you know, lumping in the car afterwards, like how are you, how do you structure uh, overall insurance portfolio? So I think this goes back to the value of dealing with one, you know, a team of people. So I have a couple of people that work alongside me, but working with someone that can look at the overall picture, we're a brokerage that can handle that myself. I work on, and both the personal and commercial side or business side, property side, but working with someone that can look at that whole picture and look at the big picture. A lot of times, um, the more generic companies or you know, call, we'll call them call centers, different stuff like that. They're very hyper-focused on one line of business and they don't see the big picture and they just, they can handle that one piece. And a lot of times they can handle it just as well as anyone else. But then you throw in, Oh, I actually have a rental property too. Or what about my boat? What about my home and auto? And Oh, well, we'll transfer that department. And now you got to tell your whole picture over. They don't jive with each other. Does life insurance get wrapped up with that too? Or life that is a, I am a license to sell life insurance myself, but that's a whole different category. We, we can handle, so the perfect example, we're kind of a full service brokerage. So we can handle all that stuff. Um, and same thing, you deal with one person. So I know your situation. I know, you know, your your portfolio, portfolio, we'll call it your net worth, for example. So you can kind of make those things work together. But generally speaking, if you speak to um, like a generic company or call in center or, or something like that, they're just going to transfer you to a whole different department. And okay. you just spend so much time. But life isn't as lumped in as maybe car. Or no, it's, home. it's it's a whole different license, a whole different industry. Okay. However, there are people like myself that work in all those and can kind of make those all function together. But generally speaking, that's all different pieces, but find someone that can handle all of your, all of your, uh, you know, all the, the different aspects of your life. Okay. Well, we'll end here with like, uh, Mike wanted to me to ask a specific question about, uh, is it worth it to get snow tires, um, in terms of saving on insurance and, and what about those apps that track how well you drive that can give you a discount? So don't buy snow tires specifically to get an insurance discount. The discounts, I think one to 3% of your premium only during the months that they're on the vehicle. So typically we'll call it November to March is usually the requirement of the insurance company. So uh, no different than a, a monitored alarm system on your house. Don't buy those things to get the insurance discount. They're not going to pay for themselves that way. But if you have them, let your broker or agent know because there is a discount for those. Uh, in regards to the, uh, we refer to them as telematics programs on your vehicles. Um, I'm using one currently with my insurance company. I do see some value and the feedback seem, uh, is, uh, valuable. Um, how often do you speed? Well, uh, I obey the laws of <laughs> the, the road. Um, you must be confident enough in being a safe driver that you'd think that'll benefit you, right? I think don't be intimidating or don't, don't assume that it's going to be used against you. Um, if you're a reasonable driver, um, and the programs do require your input and feedback as well. Um, the discounts can be worth the, t the time and energy that you put into them. They can give you valuable feedback, especially if you have kids, young drivers in the house, it's a way for you to monitor their driving habits without being in the vehicle with them. Not that I'm promoting spying on your children or anything like that, but you're just you're, telling people exactly how to do it. If, if you're uh, if you're a, if you have new or young drivers in, in your household or you're an, uh, even a driver yourself who feels like you're not, you're not paying rates appropriate to your driving abilities, this is your opportunity to show the insurance company you're a good driver. Got it. That's my speech to people when they call and say, 
well, I should be paying lower rates. Okay, would you be interested in, and not every company has, but would you be interested in a telematics program? Well, no, I don't want them tracking my every move. Well, if you're a good driver and you generally follow the rules of the road, this is your opportunity to prove it. So I like it from that standpoint where, you know, everyone's biggest complaint is they pay too much for home and auto insurance. The insurance company is giving you an opportunity to show that you're a better driver than what we're rating you for because you will get a discount mm-hmm. if you can show you have generally good driving habits. So take advantage of that. If you're not a good driver, you're going to be held accountable here. Yeah. Right? It's like those uh, life insurance policies that allow you to like, you know, connect to your Fitbit or Apple watch sure. to calculate how many steps exactly. you're taking and, um, connect to your fitness and health data. So if you're, uh, you know, an active person, you get a discount. Yeah. So if you are active and healthy and all these things that you say you are prove it, this is your chance. Yeah. That's, I mean, we could talk forever about, about those things, but I, I do see some value in them. Um, if you need any more information, more than happy to have that discussion with you. You don't have to be a client of mine. Give me a call. I can fill you in on the advantages and disadvantages of that stuff. Okay. Two last questions. Let's keep them quick. How long does it actually take to prove a loss to an insurance company? So you want to report, uh, kind of walk through all, we'll do it here quickly. If you have something happen to your property that you feel is going to be an insurance claim, report it to us immediately. Um, you w- and prevent any sort of further damage to your best ability you can. So shut off the water if you can. Don't make things worse by waiting two weeks, a month, stuff like that for that mold and other stuff to happen. Report it to us immediately. The adjuster is going to come out for, on behalf of the insurance company. They're going to assess everything. They're going to get things to tell you what's covered, what's not covered. Get that all handled. Where people get themselves in trouble is not reporting claims as soon as they happen or incidents, slip and falls, especially let us know if anything like that happens. Um, and if you feel the claims process is not going to your uh, satisfaction, get your broker, get your agent involved right away, because a lot of times we can get things back on track as opposed to waiting for an adjuster. They are an extremely overworked uh, occupation. Most of the times, not to their fault. They're not getting back to you maybe as quickly as you'd like. Let us know because sometimes we can get you an update just as quickly. Um, but um, keep your broker agent in the loop. Use them in your corner as much as possible. Okay. And how common is it to get a payment from the insurance company versus a replacement of a certain thing by the company itself? So some companies allow you to take a cash settlement. A lot of times it's slightly lower than if they were to repair it themselves. Um Best advice there, get your broker agent involved in that that decision-making process to discuss the pros and cons of that. Um, There is advantages to taking cash settlement, especially if uh, with supply chain issues, different stuff like that. If you feel like you can get it done quicker at a cheaper rate, sometimes that's more advantageous, Um, but there there is cons to it. It's less of a payout sometimes. The list goes on and on speak to a professional about that stuff because they can kind of walk you through that decision-making process. Okay. Let's wrap here, Kyle. Um, first off, thanks for sharing everything. And then thanks for the last three, four years covering me. I feel a lot better having you in my corner now because you were able to answer everything so well. And I feel like I'm covered because I didn't genuinely know, um, the specifics of, you know, all these exclusions and inclusions and right. So I appreciate it. And, uh, how can people reach out to you guys? contact you. What do you want to share with people? Yeah. So my information, um, can be obtained from you guys, um, through your uh, systems there. Um, I'll, I'm sure you'll put my, some contact information, uh, when you, uh, release the uh, podcast. Do you want to call uh, it out? Uh, Kyle M at acumeninsurance.com. Okay. That's a lot of letters, but, uh, my phone number 905- Five seven four seven thousand extension two two two. Oh no, I'm sharing the number. Leave a message of why you're calling, not just a name and a number, because that will help us get back to you as quick as possible. Direct you to the right person if it's not me. Um, more than happy to have a discussion, even if you're not a client. If you're, if you have insurance questions, I love having those chats with people because I love people having the knowledge to make the right insurance decisions because it's not uh it's not a a simple straightforward uh decision a lot of times okay awesome so uh, we'll call that out we'll put in the show notes thank you kyle appreciate it man thank you thank you so much and that's it we'll wrap here bye everyone 
Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms, so Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. Your life, your terms.